Hi everyone, I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Timpain. Welcome to the Musical Inner Two, the podcast born out of a mistake. We once meant to introduce a soothing musical interlude, but we said soothing musical inner tube and the name stuck. On this podcast, we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives, jobs, hobbies, and passions. Difference makers who really make a difference. We are so thrilled and honored to have Lee Upton as our guest today on the Musical Inner Tube. Lee had a wondrous, sparkly career as a teacher, scholar, critic, poet, and fiction writer at Lafayette College in Easton, PA, where she and I were colleagues. In 2015, she was named the Francis A. March Professor of English there, and she retired from that post in 2020 to write full-time. And all of us are the beneficiaries there, because guess what? Lee recently published... Her first full length novel titled Tabitha Get Up. And she's here to talk with us today about it. Welcome, welcome, Lee Upton. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for this wonderful invitation. Don and I were gossiping about you just before we went on uh, with this. And so, one of the things I'm thinking about is your main character named Tabitha uh, is a writer or a would be writer. And we read her journal a lot and her conversations with her boss a lot. And I'm wondering with you in writing this novel, how do you avoid the the pitfalls of self-consciousness? Yeah. I'm just wondering how you get to a place where you just can write. Well, I I guess um it comes from a place of hopelessness. Like I I never expect <laughs> anyone will publish the work, let alone read it. So that gives me a, a kind of freedom, I think. And, um, and uh, you know, I think if you expect it, you know, to be rejected, somehow the blows hurt less. And, you know, I've had a lot of experience with rejection, a lot of different forms. So I think that gets rid of some of the self-consciousness. One of the things that John and I were talking about earlier was uh, – we were deciding which one of us was going to ask, and I guess it falls to me now, uh, with Tabitha being the age and uh, uh, what's the good word I'm looking for, the attitude that she has, how much of T- Tabitha is autobiographical? How much of you is in Tabitha? Well, I think that it, uh, in some ways she's composed of uh, some people I've known and, and loved very much. I think my sisters are both in there a bit. There are some elements, though, that, that I confess that I drew from my, my own life. And I think always with characters, a lot of emotion I draw from my own life so that I can make a connection with the character that I create. Um, uh, for instance, there is a portion where Tabitha applies for a job as a waitress and she's not even allowed to fill out an application <laughs> and that appeared that happened to me and um even the way that she kind of soothes herself happened to me because after it happened uh i realized i was wearing a really long coat like something you know brezhnev or stalin would wear and i thought oh that maybe that was it I think that uh, not having you know enough money when I was a young woman, just you know living on popcorn for a while, was very familiar to me. And just you know trying so hard to make ends meet, that that was familiar. Um, at one point, she mentions breaking her foot. I broke my foot in three places, and I always have to wear these uh, little black shoes that give me a lot of support and what's sort of comical is the cover of the novel has those beautiful red heels on it and i love the cover because it's like a pulpy noir cover uh tabitha in actual life would never wear heels like that um but they're kind of for fantasy heels you know concern her second (laughs) life so there are you know bits bits of my life surely that that came into the novel it was fun to write uh, from the, a perspective or to write a novel that plays with tropes of romantic comedy but doesn't have a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old yes. in it. Life is such that every time you reach an age, you, you're relearning how to navigate. And uh, so I wanted that for her. I'll also, um, <laughs> actually, 
I remember there are different origin points for the novel, but one of them was a, a very accomplished, beautiful woman uh, was talking to me and told me how difficult it was to turn 50. And uh, I think that made me think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll create a character who just turns 50 and see see what happens. But the other origin story, I'll tell you, you briefly, the novel actually came from a short story, a very terrible short story that was far too complex, had too much going on. But that story has been very lucky for me because I took the com- the complex plot and created another novel, the novel that comes out in 2025. But Tabitha also comes from that failed short story. There was an email at the end of the story where uh, a, a, a woman writes to her publicist and tries to secure an advance for herself. And the kind of galloping energy of that voice was uh, what I turned into Tabitha's voice. But originally when I tried to do that, I couldn't use the same character because the character in the short story was very kind of shallow and greedy and grasping. And I thought, do I want to spend 300 pages with this awful woman? And so, um, <laughs> you know, I, I changed her and I made her into to Tabitha, who has more links to some of the the people that, you know, I've lost in my, in my life. Oh yeah. I think, I think too, that she's got a lot of, uh, in, in funny ways, she has a lot of, uh, stuff that is endearing, uh, even if it's in odd disguises, you, you, you know, she, she does. And, um, uh, there is a, a moment, I'll tell you, when I started to laugh in this book and it, it I found this book hard to read, not because of the book, but because I had to put it down and laugh so often, uh, just to snicker so often. I'm your perfect audience, Lee. You know this already. And, and I, I just, I, uh, when she first, there's one person, she starts interviewing this person. She's supposed to write a book about this person. And she asks one question and then begins to, to sort of answer the question herself and goes off on this fugue. And it is a riot. And I thought to myself, okay, where have we gone now? Where will we go next? And it was wonderful. We were suddenly in Tabitha land. And from there, I couldn't come back. It was what I was suddenly there. I you suddenly it was astral projection on a page. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that makes me really happy to hear that. Uh, because she's, she's kind of real to me. I mean, uh, uh, I, uh, I wrote this book uh, in an earlier draft. And then uh, I missed her voice. And um, it didn't have a publisher then, and I hadn't sent it out. I um, I wrote two more sequels, which sounds absurd, I know, but I missed her voice. And But the sequels, I thought they didn't quite work. So I started cannibalizing the sequels and then put them into the manuscript. And then, um, then again, I finished that and then I, I thought, well, I'll never do another sequel because when you do a sequel, you inevitably disrupt the character, you know, and it's a comedy. So I can't give away the ending, but it's something to disrupt that world a bit. And, uh, but I have written a sequel. I don't know if it'll get published, but, uh, it, it was partly because she's real to me in a sense you know, uh if someone says something you know unkind about her i always think oh but just realize <laughs> you, know, <laughs> that she, you know that she's just trying she's just trying as hard as she can but um i i think she was kind of you are the ideal reader both of you thank you for reading it so much and um <laughs> she really means a lot to me and uh her struggles mean a lot to me because she has her she may not always tell the truth to her publisher but otherwise she has a kind of integrity i think and uh she also has to discover despite everything the culture may tell her uh she has to discover her own worth as as a human being i think that's something you know where we we have to discover and rediscover so often that should be settled but i think uh there's so many forces that want that want us to feel we are not enough. Yep. Yeah. I, I have a, a question about the ending that I'll get to in a minute. But first, I want to go, uh, I want to hone in on Tabitha a little bit and something that you just said. 
you said that you were denied a waitressing job because you were wearing the wrong coat. Tabitha is denied a waitressing job and some other jobs because she has a reputation for <laughs> not being a very good waitress. And I think that probably nails Tabitha right there, nails her personality. She she has a reputation in the restaurant world for not being a good waitress. Yeah, she she uh she tends to tell diners about things that happen in the kitchen that would make them not want to eat what they're eating. What's been on the floor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, what's on the floor. So she, she tends to be transparent in, in ways that uh, make others un- uncomfortable. So I think that, yeah, that, that uh, you know, she's had a number. She's sort of, you know, blown her entire reputation in the town and in the biographies that she tries to write. So it's really nice when two people come into the town um, who are new in fusion. One is, of course, the the writer of children's books, Piper Fields, who also writes that um, erotica with that fanatical cult following. And the other is Ben Ventler, that really... Uh, too handsome for a human life actor that she meets. That's the interesting part of the of the way you have arranged the novel. Most of it is Tabitha talking to herself when she's not talking to other people and chastising herself or giving excuses or trying to get the juices flowing, you know, trying to get pump herself up and get going. Um, and, and it seems like one of these things where it, it's almost like a, a diary. You're going through her day. You're going through her life. Things are pretty ordinary. And then within a couple of pages, things have completely gone off the rails. And we have Piper coming in, who's got a whole lot of backstory on her and a lot of side story, I may, maybe I want to say. And then Brent comes in, who's the uh, too handsome to believe movie star. And that starts a, a whole nother train. So it's interesting to me that you've got some, uh, the, the structure of the stories, you've got somebody living their life, and then they just kind of get hit from both sides. It's like like a car accident. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it is like a car accident because it <laughs> crashes up against her sense of reality and, and her sense of possibility. And I think that uh, she's a kind of a surprise to them to them also. You know, I think they're, they're, there's a lot, I think in some ways there's a lot of, of loneliness in the novel. And I think for for in my sense with comedy, that comedy always grazes up against, you know, the uncomfortable, the shameful, the embarrassment, your whole high school career at least is right there. But also against our, you know, sense of some mortality. I, I, at one point, I should be careful of the numbers here, but I, I looked up how many times the word dead appeared in the manuscript. And I think when I, at the, at that point, when I looked it up, I think it was 53 times. And the sense of, of of dying and all, but and I, I think that that with comedy, there's always, but not always, but at least maybe with what I'm doing, there's a sense of of the the forbidden is is right there. I wrote this, by the way, a lot of it during COVID, and so a lot of it is fantasy. Like, what could you do during COVID? So I gave her the world's best bar to go to, and restaurants, and cafes, and and parks, you know, before we knew we could walk outside without a mask. And, uh, and, and, you know, I gave her in a sense, all these things that in, in, I wanted to enhance life. But that's also because there's also the sense that, that, that life could end too. Uh, so I think that I think in, in comedy, part of the, the, charge or the spark in comedy is that it's it's brushing up against denial. And that explains something that I did notice is that she doesn't like to stay in crowd scenes very long. No. And that's something that happens in the book and then she begs whoever has taken her to this or that party uh, to take her away. Now the the end of the world uh, bar that is our favorite bar uh, there there are all these little hidey holes way far apart where you can be far apart from the very few people who are ever in the bar. So there's no sense of, you know, mortal contact, if you will, but you're right. There is this sense of, of either being very, being in close contact with only one person or sort of fuzzy contact with a bunch of people, but you don't want to be in close contact with a bunch of people. <laughs> you know, one of the first two, <laughs> very much like the pandemic. Um, 
I was going to ask you about names because this is this is a feast of names. This is I would tell people to read this book just to encounter the names of characters. Uh, we've talked about Tabitha. Uh, we've talked about um, uh, what's the name of the uh, the actor again? Um, Brent Vintner. Brent Vintner. The then of uh, someone sends a young woman to uh, be. Uh, Tabitha's. <laughs> Sorry, this is very funny. But to be her intern, <laughs> and her her name is outlandish. I wish I had write, written all these down. Um, it's Tinker Flats. <laughs> yeah, and she says something like, "She sounds she sounds like a mesa or a raised uh, right or <laughs> or a raised geologic structure." At any rate, the the and there are just some amazing names in this. Uh, and the naming itself, well, it's sort of a theme. I mean, people do bear their names out in some ways. Uh, people, uh, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's quite Dickensian. I mean, in, in Dickens, people's names are what they are. Uh, you know, they, they, they tell you how people eat and how they walk, even how their bodies are shaped. So it's not quite like that, but there does seem, they do seem to be existential markers. I mean, you know, uh, and, uh, we could see a, a Tabitha who has to get up. She keeps getting up. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, and it doesn't hurt. I mean, if you know that scene, is it Paul? I think it's Paul that does the miracle where she... He, I think it's Peter. It's Peter. Sorry. Thank you. It's one of them too. So, I mean, uh, the, the naming is outlandish and, and, and marvelous. I hope you got a kick out of coming up with those, Lee, because they are wonderful. And it's a lot of fun. Um you know, uh, sometimes I can't really get a character till I get a name. There's a story I, I tell about this. I've told it before, so, um, so I'm being repetitive, but it's probably my best example of, of this. Uh, for a short story, I needed a name for a character, and I knew the character's first name was Ray, but I needed a last name, and I just couldn't get it. I couldn't get it, and I couldn't get it. And... Um, one day I was I was in my car, starting my car, and you know, like a little illuminated panel, and it said trunk ajar. Because somehow my trunk was open. And then I knew like his name is Ray Trunk Ajar. And it was sort of just perfect, <laughs> Ray Trunk Ajar for the character. And 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 Tabitha was fun. Um I think it kind of that name partly grew out of uh, the original character who was the greedy, graspy woman in the other, in the failed short story. Her name was Tama. And so, you know, softening her became Tabitha. But then it was wonderful, you know, this this story of uh, in Tabitha's raised from the dead in the Bible. And in certain, tra- uh, certain translations, it's Tabitha rise. But in others, I love it, it's Tabitha get up. And she gets up, but we never hear from her again. That's, that's it. <laughs> never again in the Bible. So anyway, that it was fun. The names and the names came pretty, pretty, pretty quick, pretty quickly. We'll return to our podcast in just a moment. But first, here's a soothing musical interlude. Born in Michigan, Lee Upton came to Lafayette College in 1987. That year, she also published her first collection of poetry, The Invention of Kindness. Other poetry collections followed, including No Mercy of 1989, Approximate Darling, 2000, Undid in the Land of Undone, 2007, and Bottle the Bottles, the Bottles, the Bottles, 2015. Her poetry has won the Pushcart Prize the Poetry Society of America's Lyric Poetry Award, and many other prizes. She's also been recognized for her fiction, her studies of other poets, and her community service. Lee's also a terrific fiction writer. She has published a novella titled The Guide to Flying Island, 2009, plus two collections of short fiction, The Tao of Humiliation, 2014, and Visitations of 2017. Lee retired from Lafayette College in 2020, since when she's been writing full-time. And now, we return you to the musical inner tube, already in progress. You have a background in writing poetry. How much did the poetry enter in when you're writing this? Because you have a whole section where they're walking in a park, and Tabitha is just enamored with the word dappled when she sees 
dappled shadows on the sidewalk as she's going through the park. So how much did the did writing poetry get you ready to write prose? You know, I, I will say, you know, about the dappled refer- reference that is autobiographical. When I was, you know, maybe eighth grade or so, we had to put together a little collection of other writers, not our own original poetry, but other writers' poetry. And I remember there was something about dapples in a poem, and I have always loved that 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 word, and uh, so I give I give that to her. She'd love it. But um, it was very hard for me to move from poetry to fiction. I I should say that when I started writing poetry, poetry seemed more natural to me. A, a voice, a rhythm, move with that, and like I all along way, I would write short stories, but they tended to be monologues. They tended to be one voice, maybe two voices, uh, relatively short. Uh, you know, you know, the power of a voice was what I was interested in. I It took me a long time to figure out cause and effect <laughs> in fiction. It took me a long time to make, you know, a sequence of actions that are, are derailed. I really had to kind of teach myself and read again and again and again other people's fiction uh, you know, for natural storytellers that's that's easy that's probably easy for both of you but for me it was very difficult but I love fiction so much and I admire you know the stories I read so much that I just thought I want to do this I want to see what will happen but uh savoring a scene was hard for me to to stay within a scene because I'm used to poetry that kind of absolute concision and also the kind of uh, different kind of movement your poems are you know they're like pinball each part kind of infects or informs every other part down to you know the comma and the, the spacing of course and uh you know the line breaks whereas with fiction for me if I focused on that immediately the way I do in poetry. I couldn't move into scenes. I couldn't move forward. Yeah, you couldn't do anything else. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. I think of, you know, the poem more of it more as like a whirlpool, you know, it's moving us inward. And I will you know, poetry is my fundamental, you know, art that I will never give up. I love it deeply. Whereas fiction I think of as more as a, a swiftly moving river. And it seems very horizontal in the movement. And you know, that wasn't <laughs> natural to me. It took, it's taken me a long time to figure out, you know, how to get people from one city into another city. And then I learned you can do it really easily. You can just say in Cincinnati and then they're, they're there. <laughs> well, but the other thing too that, that you've done in this novel is you don't have any problems with setting up a scene between two people or more, getting through the whole situation, ending on a punchline, and then the next page you're somewhere else doing something else. So there is, I think, maybe a little bit of the poetry in that, in that you've got a scene, it ends, you're on to the next thing. Um, I think that that works very well in the in the novel, or it did for me. And, and of course, John and I are used to it because John is entirely a fictional character. <laughs> so speaking of that, I should tell the I should tell our listener that no listeners that um, there is one little corner of this book in which. Someone is lying about something very important, but their lie the lie that they're telling is also a lie. It's a lie on a lie. People are passing on this lie, and at each step in the lie, it gets more outlandish. Um, we're talking about we were talking earlier about truth telling, and really a lot of people in this book are just telling whoppers. You know, a lot of people in this book are either withholding things. Or not, uh, and and enjoying it. I mean, lie. It's it's really fun to lie. I think lying is the only time when the universe acts the way we wish it did, and uh, <laughs> because we just will act the way we want it to act, you know, because uh, it gives you power and everything. But I think that's another thing that's happening throughout the book. The loneliness thing is happening. I think each of the characters is lonely in his or her own way, right down to the end. I think, even though you know. Uh, we can feel happy at the end in a lot of ways. Still, I think the loneliness isn't gone. Um, but uh, what lies do, uh, both funny and destructive, I think that's there as well. Oh, that, that's, that's so interesting. Thanks for, 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 for pointing that out. Yeah, there's a kind of like a wedding cake of, <laughs> of lies. There's so many, so many layers. And um, maybe because 
you know, in some ways she's had to deal with a lot of adversity or, or to deal with oh. her mother, which is another <laughs> yeah, yeah. element to think about. Um, she's pretty good at figuring out that there's a lie here, but not knowing exactly what it is. Um, I mentioned that, that the mother, um, it was such fun to write the mother. I can't begin to tell you. She is such a, so full of self-glorification and self-regard and says the most hideous things. But I also found her, you know, maybe channeling a bit of Tabitha, uh, bizarrely, you know, freeing and lovable. And partly because Tabitha never has to worry about her because her mother will always succeed, always come out on top, or at least she believes that. So there's no daughterly guilt for for Tabitha here, and that's that's very freeing. Uh, it's interesting too because uh, as a title for each individual section uh, of a of a particular chapter in the book, uh, you will talk about this is an email, this is a text from so and so, and then you'll go on to describe the text. And every one, almost every one of the uh, voicemails from mom is an expected voicemail. Tabitha expects this from her mom. It's not a surprise uh, the way the mom delivers. And there's a lot of in, interfamilial uh, interaction in the book, not only with her mom, but with her nephew, Leon, who owns the bar. Uh, she has a lot of conferences with him and a lot of uh, heart-to-hearts with him that she probably couldn't have with anyone else. Um, Leon, I'm really fond of, of him. I, I have um, um, a lot of nephews and nieces, a lot. And, um, you know, I know some of them are not all that much younger than I am. And in Tabitha's family, of course, her, her nephew is a year older than, than she is. He's more like a brother to her. They were really raised together. Uh, they were almost like feral children in some ways. And I had to kind of introduce the, the grandmother. It's always hard to introduce a grandmother because of sentimentality will enter into people's perspectives. And right. there's so many, you know, false stereotypes about older women. But uh, I think if there'd only been that mother, I don't know what Tam, how Tamitha would have survived it. But she had this great um, grandmother on her father's side who... Uh, it just loved books, kind of gave her so much love and affection and acceptance. And to Leon, too, and you brush the burrs out of their hair. Uh, I love that. Um, I love that the grandmother feels she would have really, she really understood Sylvia Plath. Something about that just seemed so, so she sweet. She gave so much to me. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing in the world I think you'd say about Sylvia Plath. She gave so much to me. She gave me so much. <laughs> I think that, you know, with Leon too, you know, they're, they're still bonded, you know, they're, they're deeply bonded. And I think because, you know, they did, they're, they're kind of, they're not ideologically captured like a lot of children are. You know, children are told where to sit, how to sit, how to behave, how to eat. And because they're neglected so much in so many ways, they somehow don't quite fit into the culture in the way others might. But again, it gives them a kind of, of freedom and an, an honesty with, with one another. I think you think of Leon and you know that things aren't always going well with him. Uh, and often when uh, he talks with Tabitha, he won't tell her exactly what's going wrong, but you could tell stuff is a little rough. Uh, and yet you never get the sense that things are going to quite come to smash for him. She never has the sense. I, she thinks he's going to make it through whatever making it through means. Yeah, there's something very effervescent, I think, uh, about about Leon that's very helpful to, to her. And um, he figures in the sequel quite a oh, bit, good. too. Um, See, I'd buy the book just yeah. for him. I'd buy the sequel just for him. <laughs> and, and, of course, he makes a mean peach drink oh my god everybody yes. likes was it a, a, a bellini oh, yeah, right does. A, the yes. bellini yes invented in <laughs> venice you betcha yeah. oh yeah so man i was getting drunk just reading some of those uh <laughs> those drinks oh so let me ask you about the my question about the ending without giving too much away there's almost two endings there's one where tapitha makes a decision and then that decision is reversed later 
did you have the temptation to end it after her first decision? Oh, uh, let's see. Ah, uh, I mean, I wasn't very tempted because I really, um, I just, you know, it was, I, uh, you know, I, he kind of, it's a romantic comedy, so without giving too much away, there there was a sense that, I, I guess Brent Vintner, I can talk about Brent Vintner, and maybe that will, will answer the, the question for you, um, you know, Brent Vintner is an actor, his face is on the side of buses, he's trying often to, um, you know, get respect at the same time. And I think if that happens to a lot of actors, they can be very popular, but they're, you know, an actor, they, they you know, you're new is one day and then suddenly no one cares the next and you, you can't get another job. So he has a sense of, of how in some ways fragile his life is. Uh, she, I think fits for him, uh, a kind of mapping of something from his childhood. A, a person with glasses, round face. Uh, he's from Michigan, as am I. <laughs> he, uh, he, um, I noticed that. Yes, I did. <laughs> he, he understands her language in some ways, yet he can't predict it. Uh, he likes that she's not always looking at him the way people are objectifying him in a way, even though she's always focused on his his infernal and yet heavenly beauty, raw male beauty. Um, so I think there is a sense there of, um, you know, both of them somehow need to step out of the harness that the culture puts on both of them about expectations, about how they are to live their their lives yes. and so for you know i think um it doesn't have to be this way but you know there's a sense of of Tabitha has always has wished for a kind of transformation or something kind of ecstatic in her life she's very easily bored for instance <laughs> and uh she she wants a bit more and 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 uh and at the same time, she, you know, her relationship with Leon shows she's capable of, uh, of great loyalty and, and sympathy. Yes. And I think she's good for him, for Brett, in the sense that um, there's no guile there. I'm sure that uh, there, there are a couple of episodes where he mixes with the other actors that are with him in this town shooting an independent movie. And she doesn't really think much of the other actors, but it turns out that he doesn't either. <laughs> um, and and so, yeah, she's probably he's probably um, interested in Tabitha for the reasons that um, are most people are that that she's taking him. Okay, pardon the pun. Face value. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yes. That's true. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that he he has a terrific face, but also she's she's. Uh, not swayed by that, uh, and and he he kind of chases her in the, in okay. the book, which I thought was a, a very uh, clever way of of flipping the rom com a little bit. I, for the first time, I really thought of something I haven't thought about her. She needs to be listened to. I mean, we all need to be listened to, and she's not often listened to. You know, her these biographies, you know, kind of fail by and large that she writes for celebrity interviews get pulled off you know <laughs> off even off the web and he uh, when i think about him he's a very good at listening and listening very closely to other people and uh, that has to be very attractive to her well it's been very attractive to us to have you here with us lee this has been probably the shortest half hour we've had on the podcast and uh when you get that, uh, you know, the the next book, the you know, sequel, when that gets published, we got to have you back on. And uh, I sure hope this gets made into a movie or a, or a short series. It'd be terrific. It, you know, I could just see it. Can I, can I say something? This no, is what I was- Don. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, 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 right. no, no. Go ahead, Don. Okay. Go ahead. Please, please, okay. please. Thank God no. he's only a fictional character or else I'd be going nuts. <laughs> um, when I was reading it, and he's probably too old for the part. But I had John Hamm's picture in my head whenever Brent Vittner came in. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. He, so. Yeah, that kind of that kind of outstanding male beauty. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the sequel. Or the sequel to the sequel. Yeah. There you are. Oh, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. 
but yeah, I, I, I thought of him and I thought, well, no, maybe he's got a little too many years on him for the way that Brant is described. But th- those were the qualities that I was seeing in there. See so that. Everybody, when they reads a book, are casting it in their head, right? I don't know if you were casting it, if you had people in mind, but. Well, you know, she's too young. Yeah, the age problem comes up. But do you know the uh, wonderful actor Jenny Slate at all? Yes. Yeah, I, I thought of her as Tabitha, very, very similar similar rhythms. I mean, she she would do very well with those sorts of, the this, this sort of speech patterns. Yeah. Eleanor Barkan came into my head for her mom. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> you know. That's really and, interesting. You know. <laughs> wow. Hello, I'm very afraid. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my goodness. See, so, so Hollywood just needs to come to us. We've got it cast. We're ready to go. We Just have a property <laughs> right here. Give us $3 million and we're off. Well, this, this has been really, really wonderful. <laughs> yes, it has for us too. Uh, Lee Upton, ladies and gentlemen, the book is Tabitha Get Up and it's a joy. Uh, you got to read it. And uh, we, we look forward to having you back on this show. Uh, maybe talk about poetry next time. Who the heck knows? That'd be wonderful. I'd love it. And thank you for listening to the Musical Inner Two. Hey, let us know how we're doing. Send us an email at musicalinnertube, all one word, at gmail.com. Do you know someone with a great story to tell? Let us know. Send us an email or log in to our website, musicalinnertube.com, and click on the microphone in the lower right-hand corner to leave us a voicemail. And while you're on our website, take a few minutes to listen to past episodes of the podcast. They're all there, along with pictures and biographies of our guests, blog posts, and lots more. And as always, our thanks to Virtual Band Car Radio Dog for providing us with our theme music. <laughs>